greetings world. We are anonymous. The word airborne means different things to different scientists, and that confusion needs to be addressed. They impress on all of us that droplets laced with the coronavirus do not remain aloft for long, that it only travels 6 feet at the most before it falls onto the ground. That is why we are told that soap and water are the best protections one can find. The corrupt corporate paid media repeat that message many times throughout the day. When health officials say the pathogen is not airborne, they are actually relying on a narrow definition of the term, and one that has been disputed by some leading scholars of viral transmissions. If these scholars' fears bear out, if the new coronavirus does, in fact, have the potential to travel farther through the air than officials have been saying, then we all might need to reevaluate our standards for protecting healthcare workers at the front lines. In fact, we might need to make some adjustments to our way of life. From the beginning, they said any spread of the new virus through the air has been downplayed by the corrupted corporate paid media. World Health Organization Director Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus assured people on Twitter that the virus actually is not airborne. He went on to clarify that it spreads from person to person through small droplets from the nose or mouth, which are spread when a person with coronavirus coughs or exhales. According to this way of thinking, the blobs of viral particles that get expelled from coughs are too big to float around, so they mainly cause infection by landing onto someone close or by dropping on a surface from which they are later transferred to someone's body via touch. Public health officials such as Tedros also stated that a truly airborne virus is one that floats around for extended periods, like the measles, which is known to be infectious in the air for at least half an hour. A pathogen like that can create a nightmare scenario. A sick person might ride an elevator, for instance, and shed some virus along the way. Later on, someone else who got into the same elevator might breathe in those germs and develop the disease. There are very good reasons to believe, and good reasons for public health officials to assure the public that the new coronavirus is not airborne, in that specific and apocalyptic sense. But the definition used by these officials may be obscuring vital details of the transmissions. In particular, it questions the fact over how someone's virus-laden cough or sneeze can really travel through the air. The authorities employ a rule of thumb for distinguishing what they call droplets from aerosols. They say droplets are often defined as being larger than 5 microns in diameter and forming a direct spray that is propelled by cough or sneeze up to 2 meters away from the source. Aerosols, in this scenario, are smaller gobs of potentially biohazardous material which may remain afloat for longer distances. This black and white division between droplets and aerosols does not sit well with researchers who spend their lives studying the intricate patterns of airborne viral transmissions. The 5 micron cutoff is arbitrary and ill-advised, according to Lydia Barawaba, whose lab at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology focuses on how fluid dynamics influence the spread of pathogens. This creates confusion she says. She also stated that it doubles terminology. Strictly speaking, aerosols are droplets too. When you breathe out or cough, you release bits of watery mucus from inside your body in a wide array of sizes, ranging from bigger, wetter ones, to finer ones. All of these are droplets. The smallest droplets are commonly described as aerosols. Whatever you want to call them, any of these bits of mucus may be laced with viral pathogens. To make matters more complicated, when the water component of droplets dries up in the air, the remaining bits of floating virus are called droplet nuclei, which are even lighter and more apt to travel long distances. Aside from size, there are other factors, such as local humidity, and any drafts of air will also affect on how far a droplet flies. Even the fattest droplets may not always fall right to the ground within a few feet. When you go to the ocean on a windy day, and feel the sea spray on your face, you have just encountered droplets of a size that might be described as not airborne in a public health briefing.
Even breezes that are far more subtle than the ones coming off the ocean can lift and push a droplet. Oddly though, many traditional studies of droplet trajectories have made use of simplified models that do not account for the gust of air released when a person coughs or sneezes, which gives those droplets an extra push. Barawiba calls this a mistake. Her lab has found that coughs and sneezes, which they call violent expiratory events, force out a cloud of air that carries droplets of various sizes much further than they would go otherwise. Whereas previous modeling might have suggested that 5 micron droplets can travel only a meter or two, as we have heard about the new coronavirus, her work suggests these same droplets can actually travel up to 8 meters when taking into account the gaseous form of a cough. For researchers like Barawiba, who study the physics of pathogens paths, any virus traveling in the air might as well be described as airborne. But there is no consensus among scientists as to which pathogen should get that label, and which ones should not. Julian Tang, a virologist at the University of Leicester in England, co-authored a review article on this very topic in 2019. The paper noted that for some researchers, airborne transmissions involves only fine aerosols droplets. For others, it can involve both aerosols and larger droplets. Ultimately, in their article, Tang and his colleagues settled on using the phrase to mean transmission by particles of fewer than 10 microns in diameter, a cutoff twice as large as what the World Health Organization has used. The debate over whether something is airborne is particularly sensitive around pathogens that cause the most acute and deadliest outbreaks. But there is not even an agreement among experts as to how regular old influenza transmits through the air. Those who say that the flu does this points to a peculiar incident from the 1970s in which an airplane with 54 passengers was grounded for 3 hours because of engine issues during a takeoff attempt. There was one person who had been sick on board and within 3 days, 3 quarters of the other people who had been on the plane showed symptoms of the flu, such as cough, fever, and fatigue. The majority of those tested were positive for the virus. Donald Milton, whose research at the University of Maryland Public Health includes studies of infectious bioaerosols, says that for many years, he and his peers are still trying to convince other scientists that influenza is substantially airborne. He published an article in 2018 asserting that, contrary to what some might think, sneezing and coughing are not required for influenza virus to be released in an aerosol form that can float around. Meanwhile, the aerodynamics of more exotic pathogens has stirred controversy. One infectious disease expert warned, in 2014, that Ebola might become highly transmissible by air. This proved to be a false alarm. There is some evidence that coronaviruses, such as SARS and MERS, can travel in hospital air. Some researchers still dispute these data. The MERS research, for example, did not use a hospital room without infectious patients as a control. But others take it as a given that these coronaviruses were floating in their infectious form around parts of the hospitals. As for the airborne behavior of the new coronavirus, scientists are racing to obtain data. A study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association on March 4, 2020, looked at the hospital isolation rooms of three patients in Singapore with the coronavirus. The study offered some solace because it did not find evidence of the virus in air samples. However, the air vent blades in one patient's room did test positive for it. A second study, described in a preprint article published on March 10, 2020, examined the hospital environments of coronavirus patients in Wuhan, China. Although the levels of the microbe that causes coronavirus in most rooms were undetectable or low, the study did find the presence of the virus in aerosol form. That there would be non-negligible amounts of virus in the air does not surprise Lindsay Mayer, a researcher at Virginia Tech, who studies the dynamics of viruses in the air. That was exactly what she suspected, she stated. 
Even before that article was published, she mentioned that it is unfortunate that the World Health Organization insists on saying that the coronavirus is not airborne. Crucially, the hospital studies only looked for the genetic signature of the virus, as opposed to mixing the viral material with animal cells to see whether it would wreak havoc. As such, they could not know whether the viral material present in the ventilation system or the air was infectious. This is a critical point, virologists emphasize that the presence of residual RNA or DNA left by pathogens in no way guarantees that people might get sick from it. However, the question of whether the coronavirus is infectious as an aerosol was explored in another article posted as a preprint. In that study, scientists used a laboratory machine to force the virus into aerosolized form and then tracked it for three hours. They found that the pathogen was still able to infect animal cells at the end of that time frame, although there was substantially less of virus suspended in the air from one hour to the next. These articles should not be overinterpreted. Only one of them has been vetted by peer review at this point. It also remains unclear and undemonstrated whether the coronavirus released from patients' lungs comes out in aerosol form, whether aerosolized particles of this virus travel significant distances, and, if so, whether they do so in sufficient number to cause infection. Notably, while the Joint World Health Organization in China, a report published in late February of 2020, said that although airborne particles were not believed to be a major driver of transmission, it is noted that such a mode can be envisaged if certain aerosol generating procedures are conducted in healthcare facilities. Given that much research on airborne transmission in outbreaks is focused on medical settings, it is also less than clear on how even the most common viruses might pass from person to person under everyday circumstances. Julian Tang and his colleagues have created a visualization of the breaths exchanged by two people in conversation standing three feet apart. Most of the time, the puffs of air they let out remain separate, but portions of their exhalations do sneak from each person's breathing space into the others. Given all this uncertainty, some experts say there needs to be better public messaging on the spread of the coronavirus. Crowded public transport, where people can breathe on each other, may also lead to transmission of infection. Tang says, echoing public health advice that, while widespread, may not be getting as much emphasis as hand washing. Milton agrees, adding that, it might be wise to shut off air circulation systems in cars, which could potentially spread the pathogen among passengers. When public health officials say a pathogen is, or is not airborne, creates a false dichotomy, which does not keep people safe. In this particular case, the people who are most at risk for airborne transmission are medical workers. There are concerns about insufficient supplies of respirators. The US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention updated its guidance for healthcare personnel dealing with the coronavirus pandemic. Based on its assertion that airborne transmission from person to person over long distance is unlikely, the agency said that face masks, presumably the floppy surgical masks, do not do as much to protect against floating pathogens. But if the studies and preprint articles prove to be correct, and the coronavirus falls somewhere on the spectrum of airborne nest or not at all, then this pandemic should show all of us how corrupted governments alongside with scientists truly are. We are anonymous. We are legion. We do not forgive. We do not forget to all corrupt governments and psychotic scientists. It is only a matter of time, till we, as one, as humanity, end your corrupt control over all of us. So. Expect that.